Hey everyone, Tom the Dilettante here, and welcome to an episode of Comments and Libations, where I review as many of your comments as I can in 10 minutes, while having a drink. Today's drink is going to be a few fingers of Glenn Farkless 17-year-old single malt Highland Scotch Whiskey. Normally I drink it neat, but it's a hot day today and I just feel like a little bit of ice. Plus, I recently got one of them sphere-making ice ball maker thingies, so I just had to give it a shot. No pun intended. All right, let's get into your comments. The first one here by Separus on the GMRS Radio one. Why bother with these and not just go into ham radio? Um, hey, that's a fine question, right? I mean, ham radio is what I recommend. N9JDI is my call sign. WRJE548 is my GMRS call sign. I would say stick to GMRS if you don't need amateur radio. Basically, if all you're using it for is some uh, occasional walkie-talkie style communications, either between vehicles or while you're foot mobile on a hike or something, then GMRS is probably all you need. But that being said, since technically you do need a license for GMRS, and even though it's test-free, why not just take the extra step and get into amateur radio? After all, the test is super simple. It's 25 questions that you can take off a pool of multiple choice things available on the internet. At the very least, and other hams are gonna hate me for this, you can just memorize the answers. Honestly, I had done that, and I found the real learning to occur after I got my license and started tinkering. I do agree with this guy's sentiment, though. Why not get into ham radio? After all, amateur radio offers a whole lot of other options out there above and beyond GM. MRS, FRS, MERS, CB, and some other commonly used FM or AM only uh, radios. There's a couple things I want to do yet on this channel regarding amateur radio, mostly for people like me when I was first starting out. So if you're new to the hobby or think you're interested in it, let me know what kind of questions you have about it in the comments below and I'll be sure to try to address them in those future videos. Next one by Jay. Another great video. I must be weird, but I love the sound of the clips snapping into place. LOL. That was when I put the uh, Ram track on my Subaru Crosstrek. Dude, there's nothing wrong with that. That's like one of those ASMR, is that what you call it, right? The satisfying noises. Nothing, well, few things are as satisfying as getting that nice click. And few things are more terrifying than when you're pulling off a panel and you don't get a click, you get a crack. Um, anyone who's pulled off enough panels in their life certainly knows what I'm talking about and that sucks. Next one from Tad Casper on the coolest radio you've probably never heard of. Do you need internet to use this? No, you don't. And uh, I get this question more often than you might think. And in retrospect, it's probably because I failed to really point out that this is the case. The SDR dongle, the software defined radio dongle, really just converts analog FM or AM, or basically analog radio signals into a digital one for your computer to read and interpret. The computer serves as the demodulator and to serve it up as, uh, as sound. So you can you can run that thing completely independent of civil infrastructure. You do not need internet, you do not need cell towers, you do not need a cell signal, you don't need Wi-Fi, anything like that. All you, all you need is a laptop with power, and for that you can use one of the myriad uh, portable power stations that I've shown on this channel, uh, and some solar power. So as long as you can keep that thing running, you will be good to go. Jack Charity, coolest radio you've probably never heard of. Great video! Why on earth would anyone give it a thumbs down? Everyone has an opinion, Jack. What can I say? From Dave. Here you go, Jack. Thumbs down, only for the unnecessary intro. Didn't come here for that. Well, Dave, there's only one thing I can really say to you about that. Well. Bye. <sighs> Tor says, you're one of my favorite YouTubers. Aw, thanks. I initially found you looking for info on SDRs, then the dipole sticks, but continued to watch your other videos. I think you're a great YouTuber because you're a very effective communicator. No filler, no clickbait. You present information very effectively. Well, thank you, Tor. That's something I consciously try to do. There's three things that come to mind when I try to create a piece of content for this channel. One, provide value to the viewer. In other words, to me that means being information dense, cutting out as much fluff as possible, and giving you something that you can actually walk away from watching one of my videos knowing uh, either new or having some new piece of information or whatever. Save for vlogs like this, this is just more for fun. Two, be respectful of the viewer's time. When I'm looking through YouTube channels and I see a topic of interest that I would actually really like to watch, but then look at the timestamp and find out that it's 57 minutes long, there's no way in hell I'm clicking on that thing. I tend to subscribe to what other YouTubers call short form content. So I strive for 15 minutes or less. 
Things that run longer than that are usually, uh, you know, more robust reviews or something of that nature, where I do believe it's still pretty information dense because there's just a lot of things that I had either tested or want to share with you uh, as main takeaways. Really, what I do is I try to create content that I would want to watch, and I'm a pretty picky bastard, so uh, yeah, we'll get there. Third and lastly, this one's more for me. Have fun. So I'm a big dork, I like to tinker with a lot of things, hence the dilettante moniker, and making videos is one of those things that I just want to enjoy, otherwise I would have stopped by now. So injecting some creative elements, doing things that I just find quirky or fun, whether it's editing or shooting the video or experimenting with audio, uh, these, are, these are things that I do in order to keep it engaging for me. Nonetheless, thank you Tor, I really appreciate that, that means a lot to me and I hope the rest of you feel similarly as well. Next, Brant Daniels from the Electrical Assembly Upgrade on the Crosstrek. How do you like those water bricks? I'm not too thrilled on the design. I saw something similar called aqua bricks that seem to have a much better design. Well Brant, I actually like my water bricks quite a bit until I read your comment and looked up these aqua bricks. Now I can't unsee the fact that I just really hate the form factor of the water bricks now. The timing of your comment is rather auspicious because when I was out in Utah and I brought a couple water bricks with me, they were easy to deploy, they carried my water, I liked them a lot, they stowed very well, but I did not like the fact that the freaking water outlet was dead center of the brick. So that meant you had half the tank of water that you couldn't access unless you physically tilted it up. These aqua bricks, now that I see them, they look like they take care of this design flaw. And I wish I had known about these when I bought the water bricks because now I would have bought the aqua bricks instead. I still might. I don't know. What do you guys think? Mr. Alex from the 5 Things to Know About GMRS. With the GMRS licenses family coverage, if my wife is at camp and I'm hiking with a group, would she and I both identify using the same call sign when talking to each other over the radio? That's another good question. Um, I've actually looked this up a couple times and I cannot get a straight answer. Even from the FCC rules and so forth, it's, it's I don't speak legalese or all that kind of bureaucratic jargon, so trying to decipher what the hell they're trying to say in that uh, hasn't been easy for me. My takeaway on this one is that from a GR GMRS license, since you are the primary station licensee, in other words, your name is on the GMRS license, and it covers members of your family, it's my understanding that yes, you would all use that call sign to identify yourselves uh, periodically and at the end of transmissions while using your license and that service. I have heard it told, and what I do myself when I'm sharing with family members, like my cousin, my wife, or my sister, or whomever, is to suffix my call sign with Alpha, Bravo, or so forth. So I'm Alpha, right, because I'm the licensee, and just because it sounds cool. So I'll be like WRJE 948 Actual Alpha, uh, calling WRJE 948 Bravo. And honestly, once you identify yourself using the station, you can just be, hey, Bill, hey, Bob, um, and, and, and you're probably good to go. As other commenters have astutely pointed out, you're not going to be chased down by the FCC Mafia and, and they're not going to be kicking down your door if you fail to identify yourself using a call sign on a GMRS frequency. At least the odds are very low. From Orkham Esas, doesn't exhaust gas cause health problems from my first Chinese diesel heater video? Yeah, it, it most certainly does. Um, I got this comment a lot on this video because I, what I had done was for illustrative purposes only fired up that diesel heater inside my garage. What was not in frame was my open door and my carbon monoxide detector directly above me. Nonetheless, I can see why people would get the impression that I'm sitting here like a dumbass running an exhaust heater and sucking in all the fumes. So don't do that. The exhaust gases are bad for you. If you're gonna run that thing, make sure you're in a well-ventilated area, or at least find some way to route the exhaust outside. Four in the morning from the Smartelli cordless fan. What batteries are being used in a unit? 18650, are they user replaceable? With the unit being solidly built, I would, like to, I would like it to last longer than two to three years of normal battery life by being able to replace the batteries myself. You know, good question, that would be nice to do. When I went to check out the back of the Smartelli fan, wouldn't you know it, it had these freaking proprietary looking triangular shaped bit head 
fasteners. I don't have one of those, so off to Amazon I went and purchased a pack. When I did take the cover off, I found that it did in fact contain a pack of 18650 batteries. However, I like Lieutenant Fan too much to start ripping its guts out, and I really don't know how I'd put it back together in case I f***ed it up. So I'm going to leave this question half answered. Yes, it is composed of a, a battery pack of 18650 batteries. How many? I don't know. How easy they are to remove and replace? I'm afraid I also don't know. If the day ever comes when the thing shits to bed and I need to replace them, I'll give it a shot, but until then, I'm quite happy having Lieutenant Fan work the way he does today. From GTA ItBiz, can someone use a ham radio without a license in an emergency? Um, I think I'm going to rephrase this question to be, can you legally operate or transmit on a ham radio in an emergency without a license? To that, the answer is yes. In any case of emergency where life or property, you know, the standard definition I think it is, uh, uh, is, je is in jeopardy, you can use any communication means at your disposal to seek help. I think there's some caveats in the wording of this rule, though, that says you have to have tried and exhausted all other reasonable means of communication. So my interpretation of that is that if you do have a cell phone that's got service and working and you have a ham radio in your other hand, that can also reach somebody, you are obligated to use the one that doesn't require a license to operate. Anyway, the reason I rephrase this question to can you legally transmit as opposed to can you use a ham radio is because quite honestly, if you don't know what you're doing on a ham radio, if you have never seen or, f or worked one before in your life and you pop it open, there's a lot of shit going on on an amateur radio and chances of you being able to effectively use it for communications are probably pretty slim. With a ham radio, if you don't know how to turn it on, what common frequencies to use, how to program it in, if you picked up my amateur radio, for example, chances are it's on memory mode with local repeaters and different frequency offsets programmed in. Um, and if you pick that up while I'm away from my local repeater network, you're not gonna be able to hit shit. So knowing how to take it off from manual and put it on VFO mode, knowing what the national call frequency is, and then knowing some of the communication protocols associated with amateur radio operators is gonna just be helpful. All right, that's time, ladies and gentlemen. 10 minutes-ish, I hope, is what I'm targeting for in editing. Thank you, as always, for joining. If you like this form of content, please hit that like button and let me know in the comments, and I'll try to do more of them. Right off the bat, I'm thinking this uh, comments and libations should be a monthly thing. What do you think? Thank you, as always, for watching. Until the next time, this is Tom the Dilettante saying, have a good one. Take it easy. What's up everyone, Tom the Dilettante here, and welcome to an episode of Comments and Libations, where I take 10 minutes to review 10... 10 comments? No, that's not true. Where I review as many of your comments as I can in 10 minutes. That's what I wanted to say. Today's drink is going to be a few fingers of Glenn Farclas, 18... 18? No, 17. It says it right there, I just can't read.